Thank you. Uh, I've got 15 minutes to tell you about uh, a way that we're now looking for genes. Uh, my idea of personalized medicine, I guess, is I own my own companies and name them what I want. Uh, the complex disease genetics, uh, other than cancer, uh, uh, have been widely used, and people have used things like GWAS and a number of other things, and every week you would read another uh, 10, 15, 20 uh, candidate genes that might be related based on the statistical analysis of, in this case, a million SNPs across a genome where only three or four of those SNPs would give you any information about anything in any particular reason. Um, so over 99.9% .9 of them would be. Everybody's been talking about missing heritability. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk, I'm going to tell you about structural DNA length polymorphon, polymorphisms, uh, which are in introns and located outside of the exome that can cause functional changes by affecting the variants around the mean of that gene. Uh, Shen et al. have illustrated several examples in experimental organisms. It isn't anything uh, that's uh, unique to humans, uh, but I'm going to give you some multiple examples in neurologic and non-neurologic complex diseases. Uh, so we described the method to identify highly informative polymorphisms uh, with a more complexity than a SNP. Uh, our work in Alzheimer's disease allowed us to look at this poly-T, which is highly, highly variable at a single locus. And therefore, it became informative. What do I mean by informative? Well, you all have an ABO blood type, uh, but none of you are going to get a blood transfusion without having somebody look at it. It, it gives you the variance that's important for uh, certain phenotypic uh, interventions. Oops, let me see. Uh, so one of the things that simple definitions for missing heritability is that you don't see it if you don't measure it. And what hasn't been measured is the informativeness of multiple structural DNA polymorphisms that exist across the genome. Uh, I'm going to walk you through part of this uh, with respect to Alzheimer's to make the definition clear, and then I'm going to show you another example. In Alzheimer's disease, what we did is we took this region, uh, which was in the middle of the linkage disequilibrium region that had several genes, APOE, TOM40, APOC2, uh, APOC1, and uh, we did deep sequencing of uh, approximately 100 uh, patients and controls. Uh, and then we looked at uh, this, this region. We found four uh, regions in those square boxes where there were poly-T elements. And the straight lines are SNPs. So in the middle of this piece of linkage disequilibrium, there's a lot of SNPs and there's a lot of other uh, uh, things that can give you information. This is what the, uh, the at this individual locus, uh, I've called 523 locus, uh, the poly -T morph polymorphisms evolved independently over time on different genetic backgrounds, but each individual that was used in this experiment has two haplotypes someplace on the map. All the APA, and we went to this one rather than any place else on the genome uh, or in that linkage disequilibrium region because we found that all the APOE44 patients that we had uh, were localized in clade A. Uh, none were localized in clade B. What we found was that in this clade, and you'll notice that uh, when, where the SNPs are there, you see these nice clean lines for different clades, and then you see these little things that look like piles of pancakes. Each one of those lines there is the number, uh, an additional person who has that exact genotype or that exact sequence. And so, uh, let's see, I don't know. If you uh, look at this, 
uh, picture in, in uh, clade B, all of those different subclades that are identified by these different uh, poly T's are all of the short variety and they all happen to be linked to APOE3. The other thing that's linked to APOE3 is a very long variety and they're all up in the top. If you look at the, the, uh, the SNP that defines uh, uh, the first uh, branch point, you can see the many branch points of difference uh, be splayed out in a map, and it is very, very clear that this group of up on top or of very long poly T's is quite different in its inheritance, in its evolution, uh, to the others uh, on, that are in clade B. Epoe 4 is in these two, as well as this one with a slightly, and these are we call long. And if you look at two different populations of uh, Caucasians, you can see that on the top of each one uh, are those lengths that are linked to E3, and then on the uh, bottom of each one are those lengths that are linked to E4. So you now develop the three allele system. And when you use that, what it does, uh, and this is now mapping the, uh, all, the, all, the pay, all the population, not just the E4 risk. Uh, if you look at the red line, that's the old E4, E4 line, but it's a long, long line. If you look at the E3, E4, that is now E4 plus either a short or a long and gives you two, two uh, age of onset curves uh, in black. 3-3, three, three, which represents 60% of the Caucasian population, was totally indistinguishable before, but now you can see the short, short, which is the first line, uh, earliest line, the short, very long, or then the very long, very long. Uh, so for an N of one, uh, which one would you want to have if this is the risk for Alzheimer's disease as you grow older? Yeah. Uh, so we're using this kind of information for a drug trial. It's called the Tomorrow Study, T-O-M-M, -M, spelling tomorrow. Uh, and uh, Takeda Pharmaceuticals is the IND sponsor. And we're using this to pick out people who are at the greatest risk of developing uh, the beginning symptoms of mild cognitive impairment of the Alzheimer's type uh, at different ages that you can see where the downward spiral uh, starts. And we're simply classifying them between the ages of 65 and 83 based on their age that they are at and their genotype, whether they are at high risk or low risk of getting the onset of symptoms within the next five years. And that's an algorithm that you can read about that's been published. And this is the trial. Uh, the high-risk group gets put in, they get randomized to a placebo or a treatment. In this case, it's low-dose uh, pioglitazone. And the low-dose are put in there so that we could have diagnostic uh, numbers when, as, when you're evaluating it as a diagnostic. Uh, and this then is to look at the effect of that drug slowing down the progression of the high-risk lines. And that's going to be a five years, approximately a five-year study. Okay, so one of the things this taught me was that uh, we can get very, very high informativity, informativeness at a single locus in a region of linkage disequilibrium that allows us to separate out and splay out on a map people whose individual haplotypes we can identify. So each DNA polymorphism of these uh, structural DNA polymorphisms, you know, has a location on the genome. And there are over a million of them of various types. Uh, we've put together a library of, of most of them. 
the structural mutations re represent the variants in not understood areas of the genome, i.e. they're in introns, or they're in the junk DNA. Is, or this isn't the triple repeat that knocks into a, uh, uh, an exon. And so the first step is very, very simple. In silico, we take the known location of every gene that we consider a, a, a risk gene uh, for a candidate gene, and we take the library of these poly uh, A, poly T, poly uh, dinucleotide uh, uh, molecules, and we just ask which of our candidate genes are nearby one of these, and then we look at what we get at the answer, and we start to then work up the genes. So this is not a step that needs to be corrected by a million tests for association. All we're doing is asking which of our genes are located at or near uh, one of these DNA mutations. And then we characterize that DNA much better than is in the uh, literature that we all use for looking at genomes, because next generation sequencing, frankly, doesn't go out to 50 Ts. Doesn't go out to 10, 20 Ts. Doesn't even go out to 10 most of the time. Uh, we're limited by the, by the technology. So we have ones in which we know may be highly polymorphic and long, and ones which are nubbins. And if you happen to come to a nubbin that will had only eight and you want to characterize it, you can then characterize it by Sanger sequencing. So here's an example. This is a, uh, a real example uh, of another disease. This is uh, not uh, Alzheimer's disease. And this is the phylogenetic map that was created uh, for uh, a, a location that is a uh, acceptor, a receptor uh, for a particular uh, molecule. And you can see there are some areas where there's a lot of fuzz and there's some areas are, and it's very difficult to look at that sort of data. But if you uh, just look at it, take away the fuzz, and just look at the different uh, steps that you can get the subclades, there are two major subclades, just like there was in the other one. But there's no statistical separation by phenotype of responders to the drug versus non-responders. The data from this comes from five small phase two trials uh, put together to look for those people who had a quantitative improvement to be called efficacy using what uh, in this disease would be acceptable for endpoints by the FDA. Subclade contains sequences only from responders, no non-responders, and both haplotypes from each individual's are contained in that clade. So let me blow that clade up. That, that blows up to this, and where there's a C and where there's a C prime, there's a big pile of pancakes, multiple people who have their two alleles in one of each of these. And in fact, there are no homozygous Cs. There are no homozygous C primes. They all, all, have a C and a C prime. Exquisite informativity. Okay. okay, so there's a lot of advantages to doing this, and we've done it in a number of different diseases. Uh, one of them is obesity. Essentially, instead of using age of onset, we use body mass index as the continuous uh, variant. And I think I'll stop there.